Welcome into the KSO Sunday show. Mason, both KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway here with you. And we come to you. I mean, Drew, we've said it before when uh, commits happen. If you're hearing from us, somebody <laughs> either died or K-State got a commitment. Uh, I think the thing that died might be the K-State basketball season yesterday in Stillwater, Oklahoma, where things felt bleak and not very fun after the 20-point home loss to Oklahoma. And and somehow things managed to get worse when you thought, okay, three-game losing streak, this is the perfect opportunity, worst team in the league, and K-State, who got off to a strong start yesterday. They they were holding OSU at arm's length, but what we saw is problems throughout the entirety of the season. They crept into that game at different points, where in the first half, you know, K-State has that five-point lead most of the time. They're getting some stops, but – the offense wasn't crisp enough to ever extend it past five. So early on, that was the problem for K-State. Well, then as you talked about extensively in the instant reaction, Drew, like K-State couldn't get any stops in the second half then. The offense finally came around. Nobody was doing anything on defense. And despite the fact that K-State had just a really strong second half offensively, Oklahoma State still outscored them in the second half. And so all these issues that we've talked about all season for K-State, they manifested themselves in one game where you finally got close to all three guys that are your major offensive weapons contributing in a big way. And K-State ended up falling short with a three-point loss to Oklahoma State. So, Drew, I'll start with you uh, since you were down there with us. Uh, what is the takeaway from where K-State sits now after four straight losses and going to four and five in Big 12 play? It's just hard to be optimistic after this week, I think, because I called the Oklahoma game kind of like the perfect get-right spot. You're playing a team that I still don't think is that great, and you played them at home coming off of two straight losses on the road, which I kind of brushed off last week as that's just life on the road in the Big 12. Like You're rarely going to have a team go – one and one or two and oh when in a two road game week. So the last week was kind of a brush it off. Like I even said last Sunday, I thought K-State was gonna win the next three because it seemed like this was the stretch that could define the season and get K-State back on track. And then Tuesday night you are discouraged because I was pretty upset about the effort Tuesday night and didn't think that they tried hard at any point during the game. And then you get yesterday and you, they did the perfect way to lose to a really bad team where Oklahoma State was begging K-State to put the game away in the first half, and K-State never did. And I don't know what was said in the locker room at halftime, but no single person in a K-State uniform looked like they wanted to play any kind of defense in the second half, which is really rare for this team because even in the Oklahoma game, the offense was pretty terrible. But the defense, for the most part, was what kind of kept them in the game and how they got back into the game before it got out of hand at the end. But there was no effort or looking like they wanted to play a lick of defense yesterday, which is what is interesting to me about people calling out, like, why did they go into a 1-3-1 zone? Well, in the first five minutes... Oklahoma State scored 15 points when K-State was playing man-to-man because nobody could guard the ball. So you had to switch something up, and it just happened that the zone was worse or or equally like as bad. Like I, I don't think that they were, would have gotten a stop in man or zone. So it was more of like a, I don't know what you could have done any different because they just didn't look interested on the defensive end of the floor. Yeah, they they switched to the zone there basically to try and throw Oklahoma State off the scent. Give them something different and just ma- make them think and have to respond differently offensively. But Oklahoma State answered that call, and the, the problem with going to the zone, the, the two things that you need there, because Oklahoma State was shooting it really well in the second half, and if, if you're getting shots to fall, like the zone can be uh, something you really enjoy as an offense. What you need defensively to be good at it K-State didn't have yesterday. You have to have effort, which guys were not closing out. They were not fighting through screens. They were, we, I mean, there was one point where Tyler Perry was guarding nobody. He was on the left wing guarding nobody. 
the the guy had completely disappeared from him. He had no idea where to find him. And that that cannot happen. And you also have to just be a team that has strong basketball IQ. You have to be a smart team. And all season, I have not thought that K-State has that. I just don't think that this is a team that understands the game well enough. And so when you have a lack of all those things, it, you're going to struggle to play a zone defense, where some teams can do it. But K-State yesterday for sure, and I think really for most of the season, I don't think they had the capacity to be successful playing that type of defense. No, it, <clears throat> I agree with you. The The zone is – Peng has always used the zone as a change-up, but it's been a three or four or five possession defense and back to man. And <clears throat> the surprise was to me was that they stuck with it for – a large part of the second half. And I, I agree with you, Drew, that it, it wasn't making a difference either way. I think they thought they had to try something different. Um, it was kind of a, a bit of a desperation move, I think, at that point once they, they knew that Oklahoma State was knocking down shots and in case they wasn't doing much to stop them. Um, so you stick with it and you – the Oklahoma State's efficiency did drop slightly, but – it dropped from like 1.5 to 1.3. So that's not, that's not a big difference when you're still giving up that many points per possession. So um, <clears throat> I, I just don't think they had an answer. Um, and, and I think like you guys said, and you saw it better firsthand is just the breakdowns uh, on defense that we haven't seen as much this year um, really reared their l ugly head in that game. And, you know, it, <clears throat> the defense has had been good most of the season, but, we're now looking at in the last four games, they've had three of their worst four defensive performances this season, efficiency wise at Iowa state at Houston and then at Oklahoma state. So you're, I mean, your defense is not going to be as good generally on the road, but when you have three road games in a row where you're giving up 1.1 points per possession or more, you're not going to win doing that. It's just not possible to win. Uh, and we saw that we had, we saw K state play, probably their best offensive half of the season, but it was also their worst defensive half of the season. Um, and you're not going to win that way. And then you're not going to win when you have six games in a row with 0.8 points per possession or fewer in the first half, six games in a row. K-State has, has done that now, um, even, even in a couple wins. So there's just a lot of issues. Um, it's, it's, it seems like one of those deals where uh, it's like, there's holes in the dike and the water's leaking through and you plug two of them and then two more pop open. And that's what it seems to be with this team right now. They fix, they kind of fix one or two things and then one or two other things break down. And um, I, I think part of it is the, the issues on the roster. And now you have 20 some games of film and teams are smart and big 12 is going to scout you. And I think we're seeing really great scouts to start games, uh, against our offense and we have a few answers in the second half, but they're not enough answers. And then now I think we're seeing teams break us down on defense too. So there's a lot of things and a lot of issues with this team. Nine. Then, oh, go ahead, Drew. I, I got a number for you after this though. I was going to say that the, the inability of K-State to guard the ball in man to man yesterday was concerning in the second half. Like they, they could not keep the ball in front of them and it it wasn't just one player that was getting constantly beat on just, I kept calling it just a straight line drive to the basket. It, it was almost every single player. Like it, it was some of the worst defense I've seen K-State play in a really, really long time. I, you know, Scott Wildcat had a tweet yesterday after the game. Uh, and he said, effort, intelligence, and defense. If you play with just one of these three, this would have been a win. And, that it's a good point because to me, and I, I responded to it, and I just said, like, the thing is to be able to do the last one defense, you have to have at least one of the first two. A lot of defenses, either look, even bad defenders, if you just give good effort, you can go that can go a long way. Or if you're, you know, a smart player, like you can make up for it where you can kind of cheat the system a little bit. And K State just lacked both of those. And I think that comes down to the way that the roster is constructed. It, it comes down to guys having to be in different roles than they've ever been in their lives, being asked to play more minutes at a higher level than they've ever been asked to do in their lives. Like It's just so many guys that are, are fish out of water compared to their normal situation. And I think that's probably the thing that is catching up with them. 
And I look around at this team and I just wonder, they don't seem, and obviously we don't know, but this is just how it comes across because of how they've played the last four and you haven't really the last three, the Iowa state game was fine. Like some things didn't go their way. Iowa state played a good game. K-State did not play a bad game in Ames. They had bad moments, but that was a close game, and that was the K-State we had seen the first five games of Big 12 play. The team that we've seen the last three games, they've lacked effort, they've lacked a lot of things, and it just makes you wonder, like, this feels like to me a team that has a bunch of guys that would rather feel sorry for themselves when something goes wrong, as opposed to you think about players in the past for K-State where I would say they had the the FU in them, where – there are two ways you can handle something. If somebody walks down the street and says, hey, you're ugly, you can either feel sorry or it's like, yeah, I guess that guy's right. I am ugly. Like, this sucks. Or you can tell the guy to screw off and and be upset about it. And I think, like, Marquise Noel is a guy that his entire life was basically told, you're basketball ugly. You're too short. You can't do this and this. And Marquise Noel never once felt sorry for himself. He always went out and looked for the solution. I just don't see it with this team right now where I think everything has started to pile up and I just don't know that they have that vocal leader. I mentioned it with Drew yesterday. Arthur Kaluma st stood up for his guys after the Baylor and Oklahoma State game, and I thought that was a big step in the right direction for K-State. But you also have to have the other side of it like a brother and say, you cannot pick on my guys. Only I get to do that. And Arthur Kaluma has the, you can't pick on my dudes but he needs to be the one picking on them or somebody on this team needs to call out themselves and their teammates because at the end of the day, what we've seen for sure the last two games, it's not about lack of talent for K-State. It's about lack of effort and a lot of other things. And that that's where the real problem comes in. I can stomach the bad week against Iowa State and Houston, two really good teams. One of those games you played really tight. The other, you can just say off night, one of the best teams in the country. That's how it happens. You cannot lose by 20 at home to an okay Oklahoma team, and you cannot go out and play that bad defensively against an Oklahoma State team that's looked lost for the majority of the season. I, I think it's also pretty obvious that it's not a lack of talent thing because this team started 4-1 and one and should have been 5-0 and oh to start Big 12 play. Yeah. Like, th this team, when things are going right and they are doing the little things, can beat anybody it, it the issue has been the entire season that they can beat anybody but anybody can beat them and, and anybody can beat them pretty badly and they can't find that in between of who are they because i mean we're 22 games in the season right now and i don't know who this team is i don't know if they're the team that beat baylor or if they're the team that got ran off the court against oklahoma yeah and i've <clears throat> i've said a couple times this year i think it's true. I think this kind of goes to your point, Mason, of, of what is the mentality and the kind of the fortitude of the team. Um, I do I do think there's just some basketball players and basketball teams that eventually bad offense leads to breakdowns in other parts of, of the game. And I think that's happened a little bit. I think, you know, this team was – had enough toughness for a while to start Big 12 play to overcome not playing great offense at times and playing really good defense. And that's really that's, you know, we've talked about the defensive issues yesterday, but I think the slippage in the defensive issues has has manifested itself as we've seen this team struggle to shoot, even though they shot it decently yesterday. They made enough shots to win that game, especially in the second half. But um, eventually something's going to give, and I think we've seen that. I think we see that in – uh, the past four games, opponents have averaged 32 free throws a game against us. Um, that speaks to the defensive breakdowns. That speaks to not moving your feet and, and being in position. And, and as you say, Mason, not not being very smart on how you're defending and, and taking chances to block shots and, and stop dr drives in the lane. Uh, when you're – I mean, we talked about probably through the first part of Big 12 play – K-State was making more free throws than their opponents attempted, and that has flipped in the last six games. And that's a major issue because that was a major reason they were winning games is because they were out free-throwing people. And when you have that flip that badly, 
uh, the last four games especially, because it, it, even though neither team shot a ton of free throws yesterday, it wasn't like the other three, but it still showed up. That's Those things are ov- hard to overcome when you're consistently a poor shooting team. Um, you've got to win a lot of other areas, and now we're seeing those teams lose those areas. They were giving them a chance to win games like Villanova and Providence and Baylor, uh, which were good wins, but now we're, we're seeing those things not happen, and that's going to lead to two bad losses. And frankly, two losses I did not see coming at all last Sunday when we talked. And, and it's been really shocking to see how they've played this week. The free throw thing, too, uh, you give up more of them. That goes into that. I mean, and look, there are different reasons for why it's happened, but it's fairly common that when you start to allow teams to get to the line more, it's probably because you're playing pretty lazy or getting out of position on defense and you're committing fouls then because you're trying to catch up or prevent a guy from doing something. The only way to do it is to hack them. Uh, And that's what we've seen from K state. Uh, The number I was going to give earlier, and this still ties into what we were talking about prior to the four game losing streak, K state had played 11 straight games where they had not allowed their opponent to get to 70 points in regulation. Now, they had the overtime games against North Alabama and Villanova where they got to 70 in overtime. Um, so if you just want to say in total, prior to that, it's still nine straight. So even though, look, there are far better numbers to tell you, hey, this defense has slipped in some way. At the end of the day, like traditional numbers, I think still have a place when they smack you in the face. And that's something that would smack you in the face is that you had that long of a stretch where basically, what, two months of the season, you held your opponents to less than 70 points in every game. And then you had a stretch of now four straight. And it certainly doesn't seem like it's going to end tomorrow night when you face KU uh, because we know that they can put it in the hole. Their weakness is typically on the defensive end. So it's, it's a scary proposition for the Cats. And I think that just shows where the mindset is probably at for this team right now. And I, I don't know. I think it's just going to – we've seen – I think we saw yesterday Jerome Tang change his coaching style with this team where he has tried everything that he wanted to try, and we know that his last resort, as we've talked about many times, because uh, as the YouTube comments are well aware, yes, I am a very negative person. When I see bad, I say bad. Um, Jerome Tang is the type of person that he sees bad. He's going to – talk it over in his head and see as much good as he can before he has to say the bad things. Yesterday we saw the flip where he just decided nothing else has worked this year. And I have to start taking a different tone with this team where it was the timeout where he just ripped them the entire time that they were in the huddle. I never had I seen that from Jerome Tang in the, in the two seasons he'd been at K state just ripped them. And he sent them onto the floor like a minute and a half early. And they were in their one, three, one zone position with a minute left to go in that TV timeout. And then after the game, he, he kind of covered up at points, but it snuck through there where he said, hey, Oklahoma State, their players wanted that game. They won that game. And that was just a subtle thing where it's like he's poking his guys to be like, you didn't want this. And so what do we make of the way Jerome Tang has to handle things moving forward and kind of what we saw in his coaching style yesterday? I I was kind of with the how he kind of handled the press conference and everything because it, it was pretty obvious that Oklahoma State dominated the 50-50 balls. I said that it was more like a 75-25 ball because Oklahoma State was always first to the floor and they just always seemed to get the ball in a crucial situation. I mean, I, I made the comment to you, Mason, during the game that kind of the, the play that encapsulated not just the game last night, but kind of K-State's overall season. K-State, in a crucial spot, I think they were down like four. They get a stop, but they don't get the rebound. And David Gasson falls to the floor, and Will McNair falls to the floor, and Oklahoma State gets a big bucket. And, and those are the type of plays that just keep happening and snowballing. And it's why that this losing streak and this little skid is a lot different even to me than when they lost five out of six last year. Because when, when KC lost five out of six last year, I mean, you could still see KC was playing pretty well. And it, it was just kind of chalked up to like, okay, well, we knew what that team was at that point. 
this team, you don't know which team is going to show up when the game starts. It's like you you have to be able to motivate them in a different way because how they're getting motivated right now evidently wasn't working. And I would have been a little bit more concerned if how the first five minutes went defensively when Oklahoma State scored 15 points after scoring, I think it was 29 in the entire first half. If Jerome Tang wouldn't have ripped into his guys because I would have lost my mind if I was a coach. Yeah, I I, I think he's, you know, definitely learning um, in his second year as a head coach of, of how to push buttons, how to motivate. And I think, I think they probably have tried about everything they can. And um, for him to reach the point where he's, he's showing um, a little more emotion um, and really getting on his guys on the floor. And then, you know, hints of not protecting them as much in the, in the post game, I think does show that, you know, they're just trying to, they're, they're, searching to find the ways um, to motivate this particular group of players and get it figured out. And I think you guys mentioned, you you mentioned earlier how many guys have, are stepping up into higher positions than they've ever been asked to do. Probably the only guy kind of in the same role as he had last year is David Gasson. Everybody else is in a new role and a higher role. Cam Carter's in a new, uh, a bigger role. Arthur Klum is in a bigger role than he had at Creighton. Tyler Perry's obviously at a, a much higher level. Will McNair's got a different role than he's probably ever had um, and a higher level because he didn't play much last year uh, as much at Ole Miss. So you've got guys trying to – or Mississippi State. You've got guys trying to figure it out. And um, and like I said before, I think you've got guys where opponents keep coming up with new ways to defend you and new ways to attack you on offense. And you've got to adjust. And I think uh, Coach – Tang has mentioned several times guys not paying attention to the scouting report and guys giving guys their strong hand off the bounce. I think you mentioned that in the post game yesterday. So when you, when you have those lack of focus, which also equals a lack of effort issues, um, it's hard as a coach to find ways to, to push the right buttons. And, and that's what I think that's where we're at right now. And it's bad to be at that spot halfway through big 12 play. It's really bad to be at that spot. Yeah, I, I'll say this because I think at times I think people can think that like uh, I'm I'm anti Tang or the the coaching staff. I I will say that I I obviously as the the pessimistic person on the show, uh, I at times would get just I, I'd scratch my head and go, really, this is what you see from this team? Like you're gonna you're just not gonna question anything? Like I took a lot of heat. Uh, when I was pretty negative about how they played against Oral Roberts in North Alabama. Um, but I always gave them credit when they did play well against Villanova and LSU. But we're seeing those problems finally come up here. And I, I'll, I'll give the credit to Jerome Tang here. I think with how we've seen this team play the last four games, the struggles they had in some of the bye games, it, it's it almost feels like K State, where they sit right now, I think fourteen and eight is what they are at this point in four and five. It almost feels like that's the max you're going to get out of this team right now when you combine the talent and the mentality that is going with these players at this point. And so, I do want to give Jerome Tang his props for how things are going here. Look, I think I think he handled some things poorly during the Iowa State and Houston week, right? and he admitted that on Tuesday night. The issue is, is that. I get why he's doing it, and he may be slightly correct about, hey, that Tuesday loss was on him. But, you know, it, it was a couple days old. Like, if his players were still hung up on what he was saying about Iowa State and, and Houston in that Tuesday game at home, like, that's a problem that he can't solve. And I was I was talking to our, our boy Alec Bussey last night, RIP, not dead. <laughs> and we, were, we talked about the Iowa State-Baylor game, and he – uh, he, I don't want to upset the Iowa State fans that are, you know, paying customers of his, but he did say he was thankful that Iowa State lost that game because he didn't want to have to deal with all the BS that came with uh, all the controversy with the technicals and the, the shot and the clock and everything. But we got to talk about K State, and he said, 
like one of the big things about Brad Underwood when he came to Illinois was he had like this clip from a practice where he told the team basically, if I have to be our leader on the court, then we're not going to win. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're at right now, where you look at K-State last year, Marquise Noel, absolutely, you knew that guy was a leader. Desi Sills, as much as I thought he would sometimes play it up uh, after games and be a little bit of a ham, Desi Sills, I, I have no question that Desi Sills would make this team better right now. And, and that's even if he wasn't giving you production on the floor. I think a guy like that would help. And I think back to what we've seen in past years for K-State basketball teams. And now these teams were different because we knew that there was talent on these teams. But, and this kind of goes to what I said earlier about the brothers type of thing. 2011, you had Jacob Pullen, who things were not going well. That team was four and six before they played Kansas. And, you know, everybody knows and not playing in the NIT, all of that. That's a guy that obviously a leader, and then he could go out and do it on the court by putting up 38 on KU and blasting them. But that was a big deal. And he stepped up, and that team flipped it around. They were a five seed in the NCAA tournament. And then annoying Wisconsin was there again. But, you know, it is what it is. 2019, Barry Brown has a similar type deal. But even earlier in the season, where they had lost the first two Big 12 games, they were down a large number at halftime to West Virginia. and he 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 and other guys after the game said, yeah, Barry said, if there's anybody in this locker room that doesn't think we can win this game, don't come out for the second half. And while there are times where I would call that stuff corny and that's player speak, you know, there's always player revisionist history. I think that's genuinely who those guys were. And they weren't mm -hmm. afraid to step up and tell their guys, get it together, myself included, talking about, you know, Barry and, and Poland. And again, it just comes back to with the way Tang is having to handle things and what we're seeing on the court, which is a lack of translation from what we seem to think is a good coach. I just don't think this team has that right now. And if you don't have it this many games in the season, I don't think you're ever going to have it. And now I think it just goes into, I, I guess, prevention mode of having just a totally disastrous year. I mean, You've got two really tough games coming up before you get a long week off and then you play TCU uh, two weekends from now. I mean, when, when does this team win again? Because you've got Kansas coming in, who will probably be a top five team tomorrow when the rankings come out. And then you're on the road at BYU, who outside of their first game against Cincinnati has been tough to beat in Provo. I That's a really good question. Like, yeah. It's something that I've kind of thought about, and I think that I would probably lean towards the TCU game because you get kind of a week off to kind of find yourself, I guess, for lack of a better term. And maybe win against TCU, but it's, it's hard to really find a place because of how the schedule lines up the rest of this month and now or and then going into March where you're like, oh, K-State will like for sure win that because you could make an argument that K-State will only be favored in one game the rest of the way, and that's against West Virginia at home. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to call because I think this team's kind of in a prove-it mode at this point again. I think we were there earlier. They kind of did it for a while, and then, um, like Mason, you mentioned the slip in, in defense and 70-point mark. I think that's a good barometer. I I, I do tend to think that uh, this team will probably win at least one or two more games that we don't expect them to win. I, I think that likely will happen, um, but I don't know when that is. I, I would probably tend to agree with Drew that, TCU seems most likely. I don't, it seems hard. You know, there's a little bit of negativity, recency bias based on the last four games going into tomorrow night and BYU. Um, but it's still hard to, to, you know, I think some of that is realistic too and just how they've played and, and seeing 
two of the better offensive teams in the league and you're playing your worst defense of the year, that doesn't bode well unless something major happens or unless you just shoot it like they did against Texas last year in Austin. Like that's your only other option is to have some game where you have 1.4 points per possession or something crazy to overcome the bad defense. Cause really in that game case, they did not play good defense last year when, when they won in Austin, but you cover that up when you win and you score hundred points. So um, that's really, you know, Right now, looking at things, that's really what you got to hope is, you know, this team somehow finds a way to make 10 threes, which they haven't done hardly ever this season. I don't even know if they've ever done it. And go to the free throw line 25 times, which they haven't done in a, few, a couple weeks. And um, so I think TCU is the most likely, and TCU looks like a bad matchup because all they do is force turnovers and get layups. And that seems like something K-State will not be very – good matched up with so we'll see uh, i'll also say like it, it's hard to say that they will win one of these two games obviously but i don't think that any of us would be necessarily surprised if they win tomorrow like it has all the makings of ku could come out flat after just throttling houston and the crowd will be really into it it's like it wouldn't be like yeah. a super surprise to me because nothing that this K State team does really surprises me anymore after this week. Yeah, and, and so far this has been Bill Self's worst road team that I've ever seen. Yeah, it's like <laughs> nothing. It wouldn't surprise me if they if we're talking about a, a win tomorrow night, but it, equally I wouldn't be surprised if the game gets out of hand. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it'll be interesting to watch. I will say this: this feels like the last chance for K State to regain a, a motivational edge. We talked about, hey, maybe this team, once Big Twelve play starts, they're going to take it up a notch because you're playing Big Twelve opponents. It feels like everything means more now because they did not finish non-con very strong. They had the bad loss to Nebraska and ugly games against Wichita State and Chicago State that they won, fortunately, because those teams suck. And you and I, I don't. That's not a that's not a dig at Chicago State. Their situation is what it is. Everybody knows uh, why I was so hard on my suck there uh, for a team <laughs> that. Yeah, uh, they they had a they had a great game yesterday in Memphis. Um, this is the last chance you have because it is going, I mean, it's been packed every home game this year. Like every big 12 home game has had a good crowd. So I like, that's not really a thing, but there is an edge where you should feel like, Hey, this is, we know that this is a big game to where we're playing basketball. Currently, there is going to be a different edge to the crowd there tomorrow. It'll be the same, you know, 10,000 people that have been there for other games, but it's going to be a whole different animal. If you can't get up for this game and you can't bring the fight, then it's not going to come at any other point because this team is not going to decide that a 9 o'clock central time start on Saturday night in Provo, Utah against a bunch of guys that they're probably going to size up and say, these guys are good basketball players. That's not going to be when it happens. TCU, you're absolutely right. Terrible matchup. Like It seems like that's unlikely. You get a road trip to Texas, a team that, very up and down. Theoretically, you should be able to to hang with them and think that's a, a game you can win. But their crowds have been better since they built in a new a new arena, and I think that team has more motivation right now. And everybody else, like we talk about, where the win comes next. Everybody else that K State has left to play this year is playing better than them in some fashion or another right now. I mean i I said to Drew after the the game on on Saturday, like. Maybe it changes depending on what we see on Monday night. But we do our power rankings and they go up every Friday. Normally we have them done on Thursday. Unless something unforeseen happens, K-State will be 14th in my power rankings on, on Friday. Because what I saw yesterday was Oklahoma State, that's a team that still hasn't quit on Mike Boynton. Despite the fact that they've let Kansas smack them by 30 twice, and it's clear that they have no upward trajectory this season. And we know UCF is better than we thought. 
West Virginia just got Jesse Edwards back, and they they are competing. K State is playing like the worst team in this league right now, and it's not just because of talent. So I wonder, like, if you can't get that motivational edge against Kansas, you're not going to get it at any other point. And at some, like, it's just going to come down to if guys decide, hey, the embarrassment is enough, we need to step it up. But at that point, it's probably going to be too late because if you're in a position where you have to win like your last five games of Big 12 play to get to nine and nine, which is the target that Tang has always said, it's BYU, West Virginia, at Cincinnati, at Kansas, and against Iowa State. You need to use the full nine games you have at your disposal to win five to feel like you could be an NCAA tournament team. Yeah, and that's why this week was so big because you had two extremely winnable games to get to six and three. And we'd be talking about how if they would have won both of those two games, how K-State is in a jumble of tied mm-hmm. for first in the, in the Big 12. And now it's like it, it's it's look in the mirror and like you got to figure out if you want it. I, I said it yesterday in our incident reaction that like a lot of these players have to figure out if they – want to go out like this and with a whimper or if they want to step up because they, they, they need somebody that is going to be that guy. That's like the over my dead body kind of game. And you get that sometimes from Tyler Perry, but you get that in the second half. You don't get a full game of, Hey, I'm going to take over. Like, this is my night. This is my team. We're winning because I'm going to put the team on my back. You got that for a little bit against Texas Tech in the first half uh, when they went to Lubbock. It went away and disappeared. You got that a little bit in the second half in both games this week, but he was so bad in the first half of both games that it didn't really matter because he he, he was just non-existent against Oklahoma. Against Oklahoma State, he was at least shooting, but it wasn't falling. You need somebody that will have an over my dead body game like Marquise Noel did multiple times last year. Yeah. That, that's what's tough is that um, you don't, you're, you don't really have that from Cam or Kaluma. I don't think, even though they're really good scorers of the basketball and, and can do some really good things. Um, those guys don't seem to have that type of mentality. So it's got to be Perry if it's going to be anybody. And and I don't know that he really seems to have that type of mentality. At least, you know, we're probably a little spoiled because Noel was such a high level player at that level. Um, but again, you, you, you guys have mentioned it. You, when you see lead guards with that mentality, that's when K state has had good teams, mm-hmm. Barry Brown and Jacob Poland and, and Marquise Noel, that's been your teams that, that win leagues or go to lead eights um, and not having that right now. And, and I think you're right, Mason, if they don't have it by now, they're not going to have it. Like you don't suddenly become that guy. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't know what the role was or mentality. It seemed like that was what he was at North Texas, but I guess probably it's just different doing it at North Texas compared to doing it at K state in the big 12 and in the toughest it- league in America. It's it's easier to it's easier to be that when, you know, it, and I'm I'm not tr- like this is not to be a dig at Tyler Perry because look I I think I think the Tyler Perry hate and slander has been unfair this season to a certain extent like I think it's gone too far for a lot of people where they want to make him the the base of all the problems for K State and really he struggled really hard a good number of that is because there are there's such a strong lack of guys on this team that can do other things that. Teams, even though he's shooting worse, they just know how this guy, he is the only guy that can really beat us, the only guy that we fear from making outside shots. Kaluma a little bit. Carter, I don't think team I don't think teams look at Cam Carter as a threat because I think they know, like, if you watch enough tape on Cam Carter, it's hey, it might be his night that he throws him in out there, but more times than not, he's gonna clang a bunch of them. It, don't worry too much. Just play normal defense on him. Perry's the only elite guy that can kill you out there, and they know this. And I think. There just might Perry's nature at North Texas. There could be a little bit of front runneriness to that, where North Texas was one of the superior teams in Conference USA. Perry was one of the superior players, but now Tyler Perry is in a league where he's smaller than a lot of guys, and talent-wise, he is not. He's in the same ballpark or less than what a lot of guys you're facing, and that's 
That's just what the Big 12 is, and you have to find some other way to overcome it. And that's where individually and as a team, this team is struggling right now where you know, even, even some of the bad K-State teams, they at least had guys on there that had an attitude that could, that could elevate them in certain moments. And you know, a good attitude and having some motivation, that can outweigh occasionally the lack of talent you have. We saw that with Bruce Weber's last team. Like they just didn't have enough of it and they they came short in a lot of areas and whatever else. But I can tell you right now, I would rather have Bruce Weber's last team in 2022 than this one because he had dudes on that team that I do think had more of the prove it attitude. Even though I think I think Bruce's attitude would mesh really well with uh, the attitude of the players on this current team where it's like woe is me. But I don't I, I we know Marquise Noel was not like that. I think that Nigel Pack, I mean, he he played like his hair was on fire. Now he probably would not help defensively, but uh, he he always seemed to be out there with a little bit of an edge. And uh, as we know from the, his transfer process, there's a little bit of an edge there. Mark Smith is a guy that his entire career up until being at K-State kind of profiled like what we're talking about this K-State team right now, where he did have some struggles and people questioned his effort and his mentality and all that. And I think he came to K-State and said, I have one last chance to prove everybody wrong and that I can be a different player. And he did that. I, Mark Smith was a fine player for K-State. These guys are not doing that. Some of these guys are not using their last chance as that opportunity. And that's, that's a little disappointing for them. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Official time to look at the sunflower showdown K state and KU on Monday night, eight o'clock tip in Bramlage ESPN. So nobody worry about finding ESPN plus if you don't want to, uh, we've talked about it a little bit. What is a realistic expectation for how this game goes for K state? Yeah. I mean, my realistic expectation and it, it's weird saying this this late in the season, but playing hard and looking like you care, <laughs> like that that that's all I really want. Like I, I don't really, I expect the game to be close throughout, but like I, I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, I expect K State to win. I I just expect <laughs> K State to look like they give a damn for the first time in a few weeks. Yeah, I'd, I'd say seeing them come out and match KU's intensity um, to start the game, um, seeing what they what they're going to do to to kind of throw guys at Hunter Dickinson because I think K State's got to do that. You've got some bigs you can do that with, and then you know how do you handle KU's problem has been they've been a kind of a four, three and a half player team. Um, with three guys that can really score it, and Dewan Harris is a decent point guard. And then, you know, with the emergence of Johnny Furphy, what do you do with this guy that's making shots? And he's six nine, so he's hard to guard. So you you got different issues now with this KU team if that's going to be who they are. Um, so so that that will be the the biggest thing. And then you know, obviously, K State's got to make shots and and do some things on the boards and things like that, take care of the ball that we've seen them struggle with all year. KU has not been a great defensive team in Big 12 play, especially on the road. So um, can you exploit that or not? I don't know. Um, so that those are the things I look at initially looking at this game. But I, I agree with Drew, uh, Drew with um, what kind of intensity and emotion do we see out of the gate? I would think that what you want out of this game – it, from a fan standpoint and from just a, a player standpoint is think of the 2020 season for K-State. They, they were, that was not a good team. Um, not good at all. They had lost eight straight games and they were nine and 19 when they went into their game with KU at the end of February, they were two and 15 or two and 13 in the big 12. And they played like Drew's talking about here. They played a tight game with that KU team from start to finish. That was number one KU, the team that KU fans say that they deserve a national championship for because COVID called off the NCAA tournament. Um, don't worry, it worked out for you guys two years later. You you got the, the national title that you, you thought you deserved in 2020. Um, that's what this team needs to have is like, 
look, I, I think the the rivalry thing in the way that the transfer portal works, like if you don't have buy-in and you don't have enough consistency on your roster, I question why guys playing on this K-State team would care about this game more than others. Um, but the the fact of the matter is they need to have that level of care tomorrow night because the crowd is going to be juiced. This is an important game and a defining point in their season, a big opportunity for them. And like, you should just know, like this game does mean more, even though it doesn't mean more in terms of one win or one loss, it does mean more to a lot of people. And it, it, it's going to provide benefits to you. And that really bad 2020 team with flaws and all Cartier Jada, whoever else you want to point fingers at, uh, they, they stepped up in that game in Manhattan against KU. Now they came up just short, unfortunate, whatever, but they played a good game with them. This is what I would expect out of this K-State team tomorrow night where you don't – look, a win goes a long ways, and you do need a win in a bad, bad way. Um, but at the end of the day, just show up and, and have some fight and have some pride in how you play, and then we can at least start to have a conversation throughout the middle of the week and then maybe next Sunday about – hey, maybe there is some upside to how this team can play the rest of the season because we saw what they did against Kansas. But I'm really skeptical that we're going to see the performance that we want tomorrow night out of this K-State team. I, I think we're just going to see another team that comes out flat, and I think this is going to be one of the least appealing to the eyes K-State KU games in Manhattan in quite some time. I, I actually have uh, two MVPs for this game, but neither are players. So okay, we, we, let's hear it. We can dive into that a little bit. Uh, my first MVP. The referees. Oh, oh Jerome see, Tank's best friends. I was actually going to say my first MVP is the crowd. It's because the crowd's going to be juiced. Like, this is going to be a game where if K-State's going to win, they're probably going to need some help from the crowd. And the crowd always delivers for this game in Manhattan. Uh, my second MVP is Jerome Tang, actually. Because I think that if he can, because if they win, it means that he got them on the right track and like got them on that give a damn level of we need to figure this out now or we're never going to figure it out. So I, I think that those two combined, because I think that player wise, you're just kind of getting what you're going to get at this point. Like I, I you could hear me talk about how I could say Cam Carter or Arthur Klum or Tyler Perry for the 23rd time this season. But I think those two combined with Tang and the crowd are, would be what propels K-State to a win if they were to pull it off. Yeah, I, th I think that's accurate. I think <clears throat> when you do talk about players and what they got to do, you know, we, we saw the big three score 50 points yesterday and lose. So it may, it may take 60 from <laughs> our top three guys to win this game. So that's a tall task, which which probably needs means someone needs to go off for like 28, 30 points um, in this game. So, um, But I agree with you. Um, the crowd has to be in it, and the team has to give the crowd a reason to be in it. Like that's part of the deal. Like mm -hmm. the crowd in that Oklahoma game, the crowd did not have a reason to be in that game most of the time. The team finally did. And the, I think the crowd was pretty juiced in the second half of that game when it when it was a seven point game, and then it was just another letdown. So um, you, the play on the court has to keep the crowd at the game, otherwise the crowd's going to do what they normally do and just sit on their hands because that's that happens when you're not playing well. So, and we've seen that too many times this year in in halves in this building. The Nebraska second half comes to mind, besides the Oklahoma uh, first half. So. Um, how do they respond? Um, for many of them, it will be the biggest environment or biggest stage game that they've played in and, and had the role that they're going to have in that game. So how do they handle that as well? Because um, sometimes you see guys trying to do too much. And we already know sometimes our guys try to do too much, which I think leads to a lot of the dumb turnovers we get. Um, so you got to avoid that as well because otherwise – if you're you're putting live ball tournaments turnovers in in KU's hands, it's gonna it's gonna get ugly. So, lots of factors to look at um, as far as that goes. But I think it's really gonna be about the mentality of K State and can 
I think, Drew, you're right. Can Tang get the mentality correct in 48 hours before that game starts? You talk about the the players in that moment and, and handling that crowd, probably being the biggest for a lot of them. This is where this year's team differs quite a bit from last year's team, where, yes, you had players that were – you know, a fairly new roster for the most part and new to K-State and all this and hadn't played in that game before. But you did have players that at previous spots had played in games like that. Like, obviously, Marquise Noel and Ishmael they had gotten to experience it the year before, and they played in a close game against KU uh, on a team that wasn't very good. Keontae Johnson was at Florida, and he played in games in Rep Arena and against you know who, whoever the flavor of the month in the SEC. It's always Kentucky and then one or two other teams that decide to be good that year. Desi Sills spent time at Arkansas when they were on their way up. He mm-hmm. played in big big games and big crowds. Like You had guys that had these experiences before playing in that game last year. This year, I mean, wh- what, what's the biggest game Tyler Perry has played in? You know, like what, what, what crowd has been anywhere close to this? Uh, the same type of thing, you know, you think about for – obviously you have Cam Carter. That helps from last year, and maybe his experience will help. Kaluma has played in the Big East. Great conference, but, you know, a lot of these venues that these teams play in are smaller for the most part. Um, he Now, he we do know that he torches Villanova, so he probably <laughs> had a, a good game uh, in Philadelphia at one point, but it would I, I'm going to guess that they probably played it in the 76ers arena. So, like – this is going to be a different experience for a lot of these guys that you're you're relying pretty heavily on. And last year's team, although a lot of newcomers, different pieces, they all had experiences from other stops. And this team, it will be a little bit more raw, which is tough, especially for a guy like Tyler Perry, who you're relying a lot on. And his style of game, it, I think there's a lot more mental that has to go with shooting the ball too. Like one little thing off, you're shooting it that far away from the bucket, it can throw things off. You know Arthur Kaluma, he can dunk it. it. He can he can make those look pretty easy, if, even if there are some nerves there. So I'll be interested to see how it goes. I think if K State wins this game on Monday, my MVP on the player side for them, I think you probably have to have. I mean, we know that you have to have two of the guys show up, but I think that this is probably a game where you need Cam Carter because he can do things inside and out, and you're not going to be able to rely on just one or the other against KU. You're going to have to make them work. And when KU has struggled defensively, it's when there's a lot of movement around them. Like Hunter Dickinson weighs down their defense, and he, he I call him KU's anchor because he's their best player offensively and really good on that, but he's a bad anchor defensively because he's a little slow and can't move. So I think you have to be able to work that. And if you have that versatility with Cam Carter, then maybe it'll open up. Uh, something for some other guys. And then I would also just say, whoever the big is, catch the ball and put it up. Don't don't, don't let it bounce off your hands. Don't take a power dribbler. Just go straight up, you know? that They got into a lot of trouble yesterday at Oklahoma State where the bigs had to do too much with the ball before they shot it. And sometimes it worked out for them in that second half, but it also leads to disaster. So just go straight up. It's simple basketball philosophy, I know. Uh, and it's a lot trickier than that most of the time at the Big 12 level. But I think things are going so poorly for this team. Like, just go back to the basics. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you do just need to reset and get back to the basics because things have kind of gotten away from you. And that that that's why uh, I had Tang listed as one of my MVPs. Like, if they get back to the basics and look like they care, it's – it's probably because of him and what he did to motivate him. Yeah. Uh, real quick, fan, if we're trying to be positive here, where is an edge that K-State could have going into tomorrow's game with the Jayhawks? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I I, I think it's, it's good that we have uh, kind of multiple bigs that we can throw at Dickinson because we it gives us options to different guys that can guard him, um, which is a, which is a good thing. Like and that gives you a chance. Um, Ku has not been a great rebounding team this year, and they actually haven't been that great at getting to the free throw line either, um, compared to other teams. But that it's hard to know if 
if K State can handle that. K State actually, you know, yesterday outscored Oklahoma State on the offensive glass on second chances, like twenty to ten. So you saw some 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 good things there um, as far as that goes. KU also is not real great at forcing turnovers this year. So there's some of those things that we've struggled with that match up well. But, you know, the problem is I thought last week both Oklahoma schools, those were good matchups for the same reason, yeah. and it didn't matter. So I look at those things, and it's like these are things you should be able to exploit and take care of and, and do some things because because you match up well with this team. Um and, and I think that can be the case in some of these areas for K-State. But then, you know, it goes back to what I said before. It's a prove-it moment where you got to prove that you can take advantage of that matchup if it's there. And we haven't seen K-State do that. Um, and, I, and I do think the K-State defense has to, to step up and play much better than they did in the uh, second half of that game against Oklahoma State. Um, can they do that? Uh, will they do that? I'm not sure, but. You know, it's, it's the normal stuff we got to watch: rebounding, um, turnovers, and then can case they get to the free throw line at all? Because you know that's the thing that I've, we've seen that has really been the most consistent part of our downfall the last two weeks is the free throw line, and and that that's a tough ask um, against KU, um, even though on paper it looks like it shouldn't be, but it it is just the way we've seen this K State team play lately. All right, last thing on the K-State KU game. Give me your guys' score predictions. Uh, I'll say K-State keeps it close, but loses 74-68. Yeah, I'd, I'd say something similar. I, I think I think it probably is sort of an offensive game, kind of like the second half yesterday, not quite to that level. And I'd, I'd say KU wins like 78-70. All right. Well, you guys have more faith than me. I'm taking Kansas 77 to 61. I just, I don't like where this team is at right now. And bad teams get beat bad by good teams. And KU is playing like a good team right now after their win over Houston and K State. I just don't know where they're going to find their answers. So we'll see. Uh, this is a big opportunity, though. I mean, if K State wins, they're back to five and five in Big 12 play. They get their biggest win of the season, and you can start to make a case to yourself, all right, maybe this wakes the team up, they shake everything off, and they're ready to roll the rest of the season. But got to have it tomorrow night if you're K-State, because if not, I would not worry too much about this team being competitive the rest of the way. All right, one final thing on basketball before we uh, quickly talk about the football schedule that was released this week, give you some really fun K-State news. Uh this is going to be a game called the three ends. You tell me which end K-State is at the end of the season. NCAA, NIT, or nothing. And uh, give your reasoning for it at this point. So, Drew, I'll put you on the spot first. Which end is K-State uh, come mid-March? Uh, it kind of feels like NIT right now. But they even have work to do to get the NIT, to, to be completely honest. So I, I, I lean NIT. I, I don't think that this is an NCAA tournament team right now, but I, I still think that they will turn it around a little bit later on in the season and probably win a few games that they probably, you would say that they shouldn't right now, but think that this past week probably comes back to haunt them on selection Sunday. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go NIT. I think, like I said before, I think there's a couple wins left that we don't expect, and 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 then a win, hopefully over West Virginia at home. So I, I think there's at least three more wins on the table, and if they get the three more wins, they're in an NIT team. Um, it, it doesn't hurt that the NIT's kind of gone away from their system of rewarding mid majors and low majors um, that win their league, and now they're for some reason catering to power five schools that don't want to be there, but that's, it is what it is. And it, it could benefit K-State this year. Um, but I do think K-State will do enough to, to be an NIT team and the NIT will want them. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. If, if people are, are wondering uh, the, the NIT changed their rules this year. Um, so they used to, Hey, you won your regular season conference championship. You got an automatic bid to the NIT. If you didn't win, uh, the the conference tournament or selection 
uh, to the the NCAA tournament. Well, now the NIT will guarantee two teams from each six power conference based on net rankings at least two spots into the NIT. So the top two teams in the net rankings that don't make it into the NCAA tournament from each league, regardless of wins and losses, will get into the NIT. So that is, uh, I mean, that is a big boost possibly to K-State. The problem is the the net has not been very favorable to them this season. Um, I think traditionally I would say that this doesn't feel like a team that makes it. It would would take a lot for Oklahoma State and West Virginia to drop, move past this. That's true. And I think, and I think UCF and us are slotted to be, because I think the big 12 right now looks like they're going to get 10 teams in the dance. So Mm -hmm. that's true. That's true. That's a good point. It's going to come down to probably, Mm -hmm. probably Cincinnati and Texas. Those feel like the two that would have the shakiest case to get in. So how they play uh, and that could affect some things, but yes, like with the new selection rules, the NIT, (laughs) somehow is a uh, is a possibility for K-State despite the way they're playing right now. Um, who knows? I mean, we'll see. West Virginia and Oklahoma State, they are buried down there in the net. So yeah. it does yeah. seem like it'd be really tough for them to uh, to move up too much. I, I think that this team probably – I just – I don't think they're so bad that they miss, the, miss one of these things completely. Like, yeah. I just, we've seen them play too well for too many games this season to think that they're that bad. Um, we've seen enough games to know that they're not too terribly good, but I think that they probably, they probably still are an NIT team, but you know, the the next week, basically three games against KU, BYU and TCU will tell us a lot about the possibility of that. So we'll see how it comes out there. All right, let's move on. Uh, let's shift the focus to maybe a little bit more cheery news. Drew and I already talked a little bit about it. Uh, earlier this week on our show when the schedule came out. But let's dive into it. The 2024 football schedule released for K-State. We already knew the opponents, but now we have the order. We know, hey, that that week seven through nine might be a little bit tricky where you have back-to-back road trips to mountains in different time zones, and then you return home to face Kansas. Uh, Fan, I'll I'll let you go here first because you haven't gotten the the thoughts popped off yet. What do you make of K-State's football schedule in 2024? Well, I I think, I mean, I've listened to you guys' show earlier in the week. I think you made good points where there doesn't appear to be that game where you think, man, that's going to be really, really hard to win it, Um, especially with, you know, Arizona's kept a lot of their players, but Fish was a really good coach. So I think that that's a difference maker. where your your spots and your games fall, um, I think everybody's pretty much said this, but the first half to two thirds of the schedule is really challenging. There's a lot of challenging games. Um, you start out with three of your first four Big Twelve games on the road, um, which you know we're going to hear it. K State fans are going to complain about that again yes. because that's what we do. Um, but then you get a bunch of home games at the end of the year, so. Um, you have some some opportunities there that that you've got to take advantage of um, when you have that stretch: Houston, Arizona State, Cincinnati. Um, you get KU at home, so um, I look at it that way. Um, you know, you avoid play, uh, having to play Utah, so you know that's in in Arizona. You avoid two of the probably two of the top three or four or five schools um, as far as league games go, even though we're playing Arizona. So that gives you a chance with whatever convoluted tiebreaker rules we have this year to hopefully get a leg up on maybe a couple of schools. So those things look nice. Um, I think you wrote that you, the, your, your point about the multi time zone two week stretch of going from mountain to East is, is interesting to see as well and see how teams handle that. And if there's any trends with winning or losing, once we see that be a common thing in this league. Yeah, I mean, just looking at it again, like you think that you get past week seven, eight, and if you get out of that with one or zero losses, because I mean it, that that's entirely possible. You feel really good about where this season could go, because I mean, Iowa State will be good, 
but the rest of that November slate, that could be the three teams probably out of the four teams that will be at the bottom of the league, Houston, Arizona, Houston, Arizona State, and Cincinnati. So, I mean, you want to get to November with one or zero losses if possible. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, you look at, at the non-conference and the road trip to Tulane. Going to be different, though. Pratt is gone. New head coach coming in uh, since Fritz has moved on to Houston. Like that, It's just tricky because it's a road trip, and we've seen teams have struggled well, at times when they go on the road to, to G5 opponents. Obviously, uh, it, it got uh, Iowa State last year when they went to Ohio. Um, but then you, you come back and you have to play Arizona. Um, fan, how do you feel about that likely being on a Friday night? I hate it. <laughs> I hate it only because I don't hate the idea of Friday night games and the, I, I get why they're doing it, but I don't like that. I won't be able to watch it. So, <laughs> well, it I'll worked be, out I'll for you busy. last year with the Oklahoma state game. Yeah, that's true. I, 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 although I did end up watching like the fourth quarter <laughs> on my phone, but it still wasn't wasn't great although you know the interesting thing about Tulane is is we're gonna you know we we played Troy last year so yeah we'll, we'll know the system a little bit uh, depending on how much he actually changes things and move into Tulane so um there's at least familiarity there with with playing Tulane on the road with with the coach that we've seen yeah I I at least like the outcome against Troy better than the outcome against Tulane yeah uh, in the last yeah. two seasons so yeah. we'll see uh, I, I look. I think overall for K State, like we knew the the draw of teams, um, the way the schedule works out, a little little wonky. I think I do think that the it's it's tough to have those back to back weeks on the road in those environments. But at the end of the day, you get a bye week before that, and when you do come back home, I mean, yes, you might be battered a little bit, but I think it's probably better for you to have a game where. There, the motivation will be high, and we know that it will be. And one of the things I, I talked about when the schedule first came out, and I just started to kind of notice some of the trends that came with uh, everything. If you look at the like the com the Big Twelve composite schedule that they they put out, and so you can see all the options for all the teams there and everything else, and you go through and you say, okay, who does who do these teams play the week before they play K State? Mm -hmm. And so like you go down and. Arizona, now they play Northern Arizona because, you know, it's, it's non-com play, whatever. But first game for K-State is BYU. They are on the road at Wyoming the week before, so kind of interesting. We know that got Texas Tech last year, but Wyoming coaching change, all that going on. Uh, we'll see how it works out. Oklahoma State, the week before they play at K-State, they play Utah. That's 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 a tricky matchup, and this is where the interesting trend kind of starts. Colorado, uh, they also come off of a bye when they play K-State, but West Virginia, they play Iowa State the week before, and then we start to get deeper into it. KU, their opponent the week before is Houston, but then you finish off if you're K-State. Um, before Houston plays K-State, they play Utah. Then K-State will face Arizona State. Arizona State, before they play uh, K State, they've got UCF, but then Iowa State and a couple others. I think there's like three or four teams on here. They play Utah the week before they play K State. That's that's not an enviable position for anybody to be in. Um, and so I think that's a beneficial thing for K State. Iowa State plays at Utah the week before the season finale, um, which makes you feel a little bit better about K State's chances as long as it doesn't dump snow and Will Lee doesn't <laughs> appear out of thin air to play defense in that game. So it, it'll be interesting. Uh, the other notable one, Cincinnati, the week before they play K-State, they're at Iowa State, which is uh, obviously no like walk in the park uh, with how things work out. So quite a few teams that have to play Utah or have, I think, what I would call trickier games before they play each other. Um, and so that's that's a bit of a benefit. Uh, I think to K State and how the season ended up working out, but that's just a little quirk in trying to find different things within it. Um, we already know what what Drew and I said, uh, fan. What is your what is your prediction for uh, the final record for K State in twenty twenty four? That's that's always tough at this point. 
because there's going to with the portal era these these teams will change. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind, seven months from now, we'll ask you this question again. So no, no, it yes. really won't matter. That, that's, would, why, that's why Mason said twelve and zero because there's no consequence. <laughs> yeah, there, there really <laughs> isn't. Somebody might you know comment on the YouTube and say you're an idiot, uh, <laughs> but nobody's going to you know seven months from now think oh you said they were going to twelve and zero. What happened? <laughs> I would I would. My initial thought would be nine and three, something like that, because I think new quarterback, a lot of new pieces, new offensive line. Um, of course, we think there's a lot of talent there, but it's still a new new stuff going on. I, I liked your point, Mason, that you said it seems like climbing has kind of risen the floor from seven and five to maybe eight and four as as a floor of the, of what this program should do every year. And I think given the new league as well, that factors in. So I, I kind of agree with that. So I, I think nine and three is a safe spot to to start at. I can't believe that the most optimistic guy here, the most positive guy, is the only K State fan that date that doubts Avery Johnson and says nine and three <laughs> next year. We found the first person to think that Avery Johnson can't get the job done, and of all people, it's fan. I I can't. I just can't believe it. I, I think you may have put words in my mouth, but yeah, I got you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like I mean, there are, there are questions about next year's team, but I, I really do think like when you see these schedules come out now, and you it really hits you. This is a sixteen team league, and a lot of them are peer schools. The K State, there yeah. aren't the schools that are miles above you, and maybe the ones that should be, they're just not in that position. Um, it's it, it's going to be favorable, and that's why I just look I. I know that some people push back on me saying that, you know, seven and five probably is, is going by the wayside as being like the, you know, solid season, whatever. I really think it should be though, with the way that this league is now, when you're playing with so many schools that you feel like resources and a lot of other things are similar to you, but your K state and you've proven over the last, I mean, 30 years now that you're a legit football school and you've had this consistency over three different decades two different head coaches, three different stints of head coaches, you're you're on a different playing field than some of your opponents that are equals to you. Like K-State and Oklahoma State, they probably look at this in the same way. And even though like Kansas right now is comparable in a lot of ways and Iowa State is comparable, K-State and Oklahoma State should feel better about this than those because of what their history suggests over the last 30 years. And this these schedules are going to continue to feel like that, and that's why I think eight and four. I, I'm like I'm never going to trash Chris Kleiman if he goes seven and five. Now, if he does it three years in a row, I might say, yeah, what's going on here? But and if he does it like next year with you know Junior Avery Johnson and everything else, you go, you probably wasted a really big opportunity. But I, I'm not seven and five. I'm never going to be like upset about it. It's just you're going to feel like that that probably shouldn't happen too much anymore. I get it. The the odd year where you have to totally reset things and, and move along, whatever. But this does feel like for K-State, things could could work out well for you, and this is just how things are going to be moving forward with the new Big 12. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Like I, 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 I like that we're in a league with <clears throat> a bunch of peer schools that we should be able to compete with money-wise and on the field and on the court. So, But you got to take advantage of it. You still got to go win those games, so that's going to be the key. And it genuinely is just a bunch of pure schools. Like the, you said, there's nobody like at the elite at the top. There's no school that is just like god awful either. Like it, yeah. it, it's a very open and deep league in the sense that anybody can beat anybody at this point. And that we saw that kind of rise up with KU starting at competent. And now it's kind of a league where everybody is pretty good. Or has a chance to be good because I like I think that Arizona State and Cincinnati like I said that they could be near the bottom, but they are historically at least decent and mm -hmm. pretty good. And you could argue Cincinnati is probably a competent head coach away from being yeah. pretty good again. Yeah, I had a lot more hopes for Cincinnati because you know you knew that they'd probably not have Fickle by the time they came to the Big Twelve. But historically, they've made some dynamite coaching hires. Mm -hmm. And Satterfield did not feel like that. That feels like a big whiff. And year one did not go very well. Um, so I, I I write Cincinnati off right now, but 
this will be year two of Dillingham at Arizona State. So we'll see. They obviously have talent. I mean, they got Jaden Rashada there at quarterback. So um, that, that's one that, like, Arizona State probably won't be very good this year, but they're the kind of team that could sneak up and get you. Probably similar to, like, you know, year two of Lance Leipold at Kansas where, hey, there's progress that's been made and they can they can beat you if you're napping um, and, you know, maybe be a 6-6 six and six team. Cincinnati, yeah. <laughs> not buying it. Everybody else in this league would not surprise me if they were, you know, bold teams or whatever else. Cincinnati, I just – I don't think they've got it going on there right now. But that's what it looks like for K-State uh, in 2024. Any other final thoughts on the football schedule that came out before we get out of here or whatever else is on your mind after a full day of Big 12 basketball yesterday? But the other thing is it is weird to only – be playing one Texas school and it's the new Texas school um, new this year, but that's, that's weird to not see Baylor, Texas tech on the schedule. Or yeah. TCU who all of a sudden yeah, TCU, I think yeah. is uh, it, there's some real vitriol there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, switching back to basketball. I said it last night in our chat. It is weird that, the, uh, the school that keeps getting involved with these uh, technical fouls on opposing coaches, <laughs> having games after or games after where there's a lot more controversy about what happened kind of off the court than the actual game is Iowa State. That's weird. It's not like they try to play football when you play them yeah. at all. Yeah, very strange that uh, against Iowa State that you know, two of the guys that I think universally people would probably say, like, you know, probably, you know, mild mannered, like, you know, not in their personality to get uh, too, like, you know, I, I guess into it with refs. Scott Drew and Jerome Tang have both had issues with them uh, in the last couple of weeks, and Drew got ejected for the first time in his career, which seems a little bit strange. Uh, the one thing that I'll throw in here, this ties back in with Iowa State, who I know that they're very concerned about finding rivals and, and wanting to feel big time enough to have rivals because their fans were upset that they don't have to go to Allen field house this year in basketball, because that's a rivalry. <laughs> you got to protect it. Uh, they were upset when the big 12 and football said, yeah, you're going to play K state a lot, but like not every year, that game is not guaranteed every year, which I do think is kind of a crock, like, you know, whatever. It's only gotten worse with how the big 12 decided to schedule things this past year. And now this year, where if you are going to basically say, yeah, this isn't a rivalry enough for us to guarantee you play every year, do not schedule K-State, Iowa State, the last game of the season back-to-back -back years now. Because I guarantee you next year when they play, they'll probably do that again. Do not treat this like a rivalry game where there are fixed dates with it if you're going to, in turn, say, yeah, it's not really, you know, you, you're playing three out of four times, but uh, we're not guaranteeing it all four. I, I would side with Iowa State fans here because I think they're probably feeling the same way. That's just really dumb by the Big 12. Um, and I, I do think, like, it doesn't impact much. You have to play them at some point next season. But that doesn't seem like it's something a little odd going on there with the Big 12. So I just think that's a something to point out and uh, make note of that, like, if, if they're rival, if you think it's going to be a rivalry that benefits your league to make it be the last game of the regular season, uh, then you should have them playing every single year. You can figure it out. And if you don't think that, then K-State and Iowa State, it's just odd that they would play each other in the last game of the season in back-to-back -back years. Uh, I, I, I can't remember a time where K-State, you know, played Baylor back-to-back -back games to finish a season or, you know, like Colorado in, in, you know, when they were still in the league. Like, just seems kind of odd. So I'm calling out the Big 12 here to to get that off my chest. I just – little fishy, little weird. So Cyclones and Cats, we can come together on that one. We can we can unite force. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, and I will say, uh, back to their rivalry thing in basketball, They, I think they were heartbroken last week when Bill Self, after the game, said in his press conference that K-State was their rival and no mention of Iowa State being a rival there. So <laughs> I think there were actually two sides that were upset to that i think ku fans you know they always want to act like k-state's not a rivalry and then well you know last year they they had so many students show up to the game that they had to send them to the volleyball arena to watch it in there they didn't have enough seats for them and mm -hmm. they you know all this other stuff that makes you think oh this is probably a rivalry it's like nah, nah, nah. 
Bill Self said it, and he upset, I think, his own fans and Iowa State fans all in one. So that's just another prop to Bill Self. Like, I hate KU, but, man, you get that guy talking, the guy just likes to talk basketball. And he might be a dirty cheater. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, I get sucked in every time he talks about something. So he also maybe got, it, he also got teed up at Ames. Maybe it's maybe it's the like the good old boy like Oklahoma charm and and a little bit of stutter that goes on there where he just like kind of disarms you. But I'll be locked into to what he says, and I'm sure he's gonna he could win by forty tomorrow night, and K State could play the most disgusting game ever, and he's just gonna say you know that they played well or something because I I think of a lot of Bruce Weber games where he was complimentary of Bruce, and it's like mm, this team sucked. So <laughs> all right, uh, full circle talking about bad basketball teams at K State because it seems like they might have another one on their hands right now. Chance to flip it around, prove me wrong, all that good stuff on Monday night against KU. This same crew, we will be back on Sunday next week. We'll have two more basketball games in the books. Things could be a whole lot different or a whole lot worse than what they were uh, from today. And then DY and I throughout the week, Andrew, will have plenty of content every single day here on the KSO YouTube and certainly everything over at kstateonline.com. So get over to On3, get signed up if you're not, and follow along with all the football and basketball news that we have for you.